Okay, we will have the quiz uh, starting at uh, 10 o'clock today. <coughs> and a reminder, next uh, Tuesday you have your first midterm exam. Um, I won't be here because I have to go to a meeting in New Orleans, but one of my uh, postdoctoral students will come and administer the exam, the midterm exam. <coughs> your uh, assignment number two has been marked and it's uh, there you can take it up maybe at the end of the class. And I have posted your current ranking, including uh, the quiz one and two assignments. So I'll keep updating it. And uh, there are any errors that you note, please bring it to my attention. And if there are no questions, what I would like to do is continue with uh, what we did in the last lecture before the break. Basically, <coughs> the Recording. Sure. Okay, I don't see. Uh, I think it should be recording, all right? We, so, so far in the course, we have taken the approach where we learn how to classify a given model, mathematical model, how to build the mathematical model, applying conservation laws of mass, momentum, and energy. And uh, once we get an equation, how do we classify it? Today's quiz is essentially going to be on that, your ability to uh, classify a variety of models. <clears throat> and the exam would be combination of quiz one and quiz two except it's an extended uh, length and the depth of the problem would be a little bit more. Okay, <clears throat> And uh, we're going to conclude that with a uh, distributed steady state model today, which is the Finn example. And as we are going along, we are learning how to solve that kind of problem using MATLAB. And I'm going to introduce two more functions today in MATLAB that will allow us to uh, calculate the integral, for example, integral of a given function. And then we will start looking at answering the question of how does FSOL actually do its job? How does it solve a system of nonlinear algebraic equation? How does ODE 4.5 solve an initial value problem? How does BVP 4C solve a boundary value problem? So we're going to get into the algorithm that will be the next stage of understanding how process simulators, computer simulators, in fact, solve these problems. And later on, we will introduce you to Aspen. And then you will see the real power of process simulation made easy for us. And at the same time, you have an understanding of how it is developed, how it is written, so that when it doesn't work, you have some clue on how to fix it. So in the last lecture, we ended up with uh, looking at BVP4C, how to set it up, how to solve it, and uh, parametric studies as well. But towards the end of the lecture, we just started answering this question. If I'm interested as a process engineer in answering the question, what is the efficiency of the fin? How can I define an efficiency? How I can, how I can calculate that efficiency using the MATLAB solution that we have? So far, we know how to get the <clears throat> temperature profile as a function of psi between 0 and 1 in dimensionless form. So we saw that the temperature profile is a curve along the length of the fin. And that satisfies that particular differential equation and the boundary conditions. Okay, So we know once we get the solution, we know how to calculate the total amount of heat dissipated by the fin, which is given by this expression Q. <coughs> you can calculate it in one of two ways. The first way is by looking at how much of heat is being dissipated from the fin to the surrounding air, which is the expression that we used in building the model, that is the heat transfer coefficient times P times delta X is your area. And then T minus T infinity is the driving force. So the total product is the amount of heat that is being dissipated at any certain length. For example, if this is the fin and this is distance psi. So we want to see how much is the heat that is being lost. And that is given by this expression. 
Okay. <clears throat> and the second way of evaluating the same quantity, how much of heat is being dissipated by the fin, is to look at what happens at the entrance to the fin. How much of heat is being conducted into that? Because whatever heat that enters must be dissipated. So those two must be the same. Okay. And we use that principle on a differential volume to find out a formulation for the equation which allowed us to get the temperature profile. Now we are just asking at an integral scale on the total amount of heat that is being dissipated and the total amount of heat that is being entered into that control volume. Both should give us exactly the same result. And we can get that provided we have the temperature profile. Now we have the temperature profile. So we take the temperature profile and put it in here, do the integration, you'll get an uh, expression for efficiency or take the slope, the derivative of the function at x equal to zero put it into the second expression, you should also get the same result. But the only point at this, uh, only uh, problem at this stage is the temperature profile that we have obtained is in terms of dimensionless temperature variable. That is theta is defined as T minus T infinity divided by T naught minus T infinity. We did that so that it scales nicely between zero and one. Okay. <clears throat> so we need to now define an efficiency as the actual amount of heat that is transferred given by this expression divided by the maximum amount of heat that can be transferred from the fin. Okay? So I'm going to define this concept of Q max. What is the maximum amount of heat that can be transferred from the fin to the surrounding is going to be given by H times P times L times T naught minus T infinity. Okay? If you look carefully, it is the same expression. You have h there, you have h there, you have p there, p there. Instead of dx, which is the differential area in the differential equation, this is an integral one. So we have the total length. That gives you the total area. And we are saying that the entire fin, if, if it were in T0, the T0 is the base temperature, if you remember. T0 is the temperature oops, at the base. Okay. But if the fin were throughout at the temperature, that would be the maximum heat that you could transfer. So that's kind of a reference, a standard by which we can measure how efficiently a particular fin is performing. Okay. <clears throat> so with that definition, then I can define my eta, the fin efficiency, as Q actual divided by Q max. And the Q actual is given by 0 to L H P T minus T infinity dx. And the Q max is given by H P L T naught minus T infinity. <coughs> okay. And you notice that H and P are constants, so I can cancel that out. Okay, let me ask you to think now. So what would this be equal to? Exactly. So if you combine this term, because the denominator is a constant, it's a number, so you can take it inside the integral. It's not going to change anything. When, when you have an integral sign, you have to make sure that the things that depend on the distance, in this case t only, okay, this t depends on dx. Everything else is a constant, so you can easily uh, take it inside the integral or take it outside the integral. So as he pointed out, that's going to be integral of theta. So this entire thing is going to be replaced by theta. The other thing that is left is dx divided by L. So I can write that as d of x by L, right? So dx by L is the same as d of x by L because L is also a constant. And that is the same as d sine. And what would be the limits now? How will the limits change? The originally the limits were going from 0 to L, right? In terms of the variable x, they were going from 0 to L. But in terms of the variable psi, they should be going from 0 to 1. Oops. Zero to 1. So what I need to do is I need to evaluate the integral of the temperature profile that I have, the integral of the temperature profile between 0 and 1.
theta d psi between 0 and 1. So I need to find a MATLAB function that will allow me to evaluate that integral. If I evaluate that integral, that is not going to be equal to 1. If it is equal to 1, then the efficiency is going to be 1, 100% efficient. Okay? And when will that be equal to 1? For example, if theta is exactly 1 everywhere, if the fin is hot uniformly at the base temperature, then the efficiency will be 1. So that is our reference uh, fin. Okay, so the uh, this integral will be less than 1 and that will give us directly a measure of efficiency. If it is 0.6, you can say that if it, fin is 60% efficient compared to this reference fin. Okay, <coughs> any questions on that? It's not absolutely clear or it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> the two extremes are possible, right? Okay, no questions? Okay, we're going to see how to do it in MATLAB. Okay, the second part of the uh, equation is that efficiency is given by uh, minus k dt dx evaluated at x equal to zero multiplied by a divided by the maximum. So this is the actual. The numerator that I have written down is the actual one, and the denominator is the maximum one, which is going to be HPL times t naught minus t infinity. Now, I need to put this also in terms of theta and psi, okay? And how would I do that? <clears throat> Once again, I can write this dt dx, okay? dt dx is the same as dt minus t infinity divided by dx. We had some discussion in the last time on this one, right? Because t infinity is a constant, when you take the d dx on t, you are going to get the first term, d t infinity with respect to dx will be 0 because t infinity is a constant, right? So I can write it like that. So I can easily put a t infinity into that term, minus t infinity, without changing the meaning of that expression, of that equation. Then combine that with the denominator, t0 minus t infinity. So that can be written as minus k a d theta dx divided by HPL. Do you agree with that? Any questions? The manipulation I have done here is to introduce a t infinity without changing the meaning of the equation because t infinity is a constant when I take the present from t0. The original equation means will be preserved. Then I combine t minus t infinity divided by t0 minus t infinity. So I'm replacing everything with k. Of course, I still have dx, I have kk, I have hp. Everything else remains the same. Right? The next thing I need to do is convert x into psi. How do I do that? Of course, I know that uh, x divided by L is equal to psi. So dx is going to be L times d psi. Simply, take, L is a constant. So I'm taking the derivative on its respect to psi. So I can replace this dx with that term and write it as minus ka divided by hp L square d theta d psi evaluated at psi equal to zero. So the meaning of this expression is the efficiency is also given by the derivative of that theta function at the base of the fin psi equal to zero. Now what is this term ka over hpl square? That grouping we have already seen it has appeared before in the differential equation that is m. Okay. So this is going to be written as equal to d theta d psi at psi equal to 0, 1 over m with a negative sign. Of course, you will notice that the temperature gradient is negative. So that's going to flip it and give you a positive number for the expression. The temperature profile as sketched here is going to have a negative slope. Okay, d theta d psi will be negative. That is theta decreases with increasing psi. So d theta d psi is negative and so that will flip the sign to give you a positive number. So these are the two expressions that I need to program. Okay, in the in the problem that I had before. <clears throat> so let me start MATLAB. Any questions on those? Okay. Don't be too nervous about the quiz. Don't forget about the quiz. Pay attention to the class. I don't know. Is the idea of having a quiz at the end of the class distracting to many? No? You're okay with that? Fine. It's good. <clears throat>
All right. So the, the first thing that we need to learn is we need to find out if there is a function that will allow us to calculate the integral of an expression. Okay. So the other, other one, of course, is to find the derivative at the base. Uh, let, let me put up that function. This is the same function that we used in the last lecture. I just added two lines, one line to evaluate the integral, the other one to evaluate the derivative, that is the efficiency from these two. So if you see everything else would be exactly the same. I am initializing and I am following the BVP4C to get the solution. Remember, sol is the structure and sol dot x will contain the independent variable. Sol dot y1 will contain the temperature. Sol dot y2 will contain what? You remember? If I make that as 2, it's going to contain the derivative of that function, theta, derivative of the theta. Okay, And then I'm plotting it and <coughs> I am calculating M, which is given in terms of HP L square over KA, the grouping. And then there is a new function that I have used here. This is part of the BVP4C, ODE45, the whole class of differential equation solvers allow us to interpolate the function. And I will tell you, explain to you what that does later on. So that is a new function we are going to introduce. The next one is called trapeze, T R A P Z. Have you seen trapezoidal rule in any of the course earlier? No? I'm sure you've seen somewhere because you, in physical chemistry or some places where you need to evaluate the integral. The idea is very simple. Okay, the geometrical idea is very simple. I will explain that. But that trapezoidal rule is the one that's going to allow us to calculate the integral of theta with respect to d psi. And then the next one, I'm calculating the efficiency by the derivative. I will explain all, all these things soon. Okay? So, <clears throat> Let's uh, let's set the breakpoint here because we have seen already up to this point what the program does. And of course, it makes a call to two functions. One is the fin, the other one is the fin boundary condition. Okay, and those functions are written in the same file as sub functions. So the fin is the function here. Fin BC is the function there. If you recall here, we are saying that the temperature is 1 at the left end, that is YA1. YA stands for left boundary, YB stands for right boundary, okay? And at the right boundary, we are setting the tip to be insulated. So we are setting the derivative of the function equal to 0. Those are the boundary conditions, okay? So if I execute this, it produces the plot form, okay? So this plot is the temperature as a function of the distance along the fin. It goes from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1 on both axes. In this particular case, the axis starts from 0.4 because the temperature is never going below 0.4. Okay? So MATLAB automatically scales it. Um, what do you notice about this figure? The temperature decreases as the length of the fin increases. And you have solutions only at these 10 points. These are the data points where I actually have the temperature value. Otherwise, I'm just simply connecting them by the line. If you go and look at the plot, you will notice in the plot command, I'm saying put the symbol at the places where you have the data and connect them by line. Okay, that's what the plot command says. So why did I get the, temp the temperature only at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0.3? If you look carefully, this is at x equal to 0.3, x equal to 0.4, x equal to 0.5, etc. Why did I get them only at those solutions? This is the initial condition I put in. I put in, for example, from 0 to 0.1 in steps of 0.1 to 1. So if I want to get it at 100 points at distance of 0 0.01, what would I have to do? I just change that to 0 0.01. Okay, and then save that and run it again. And what you will find this time is you have temperatures at 100 points. So this would be more accurate than the one that I had chosen earlier. And we will see later on in the course when we look at how BVP4C solves it, 
some, something called a truncation error, the error introduced by using fewer points in the domain. The more points that you use, the more accurate your result is. Okay? So a very simple way to improve the accuracy of a result is simply to give this uh, uh, independent variable at finer intervals. But let me go to 2.1 once again. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> The next question that we need to ask is, okay, I have generated the solution at point 1. Suppose I want to find out what is the temperature at point zero 0.5, how would I do? Once I have generated the graph, I would just go along this line at point zero 0.5 and then read it. That would be called interpolation. Okay, so we're interpolating the solution from a grid that you have chosen in terms of point 1. So there are 10 solution points anywhere in between you can interpolate. And that is the purpose of this function DEVAL. DE solves for differential equations. So it evaluates the differential equation at any point other than those 10 points at which you have the solution. So you can choose this x. Now x here, the argument x, is the interpolation point where you want the solutions to be printed out. Okay? And that can be different, completely different from what you specified originally in solving the solution. Okay? So here, for example, we, we set here as point 1. So I am saying, find the solution. I'm instructing BVP4C, find me the solution only at point 1, point 2, point 3, point 4. Once you give me the solution, the solution is saved in SOL. I can call DEVAL to get the solution at any other location. For example, I create, let me change this as XI to say this is interpolation locations. Okay, And then I say I want it at point Zero, zero, 001. Okay? And I pass xi here. So it's going to return theta and only the temperature values at those locations. Okay? I can then plot that as well. My purpose is actually to use them to calculate my integral and to calculate my derivative. Okay? So any questions on that? The purpose of D, DE valve a new function, it always goes with ODE45 or VVP4C. Its purpose is to interpolate the solution to a different grid, different range of independent variable. Okay, that's the main purpose. So let me just execute that. Okay, so if you look at X, uh, the solution, it will be available only at 11 points. You can see X 1 by 11. So there are 11 grid points where the solution has been returned. Okay. And the graph has been created there. But if you look at xi, xi is going to be 1 by 1001. So I'm creating 1000 points okay, and asking it to interpolate at those 1000 points. There is a very subtle point here I want you to I mean, be exposed at least once. As we come back and revisit this, you will understand why uh, certain things are happening. Okay, Now I'm going to evaluate using trapeze. What does trapeze do? Let's go and ask MATLAB for help. Help on T-R-A-P-Z. Oops. So it's a function that calculates, takes at least one input and calculates the integral of that function. So pictorially, if you want to understand that, uh, Okay, so I have data points at discrete locations. Okay, and I want to find the area under that curve using trapezoidal rule. So if I give you just these two points and say, find me the area under this, how would you do that? You would consider that as a trapezoid. Okay, and what is the area for a trapezoid? You don't remember that? You don't have to remember that. Suppose I replace that trapezoid by an equivalent rectangle at half the point. Okay, Take the minimum and the maximum and take the average of that and put a line along that. Okay, And then ask the question, what is the area of that rectangle? That should be easy to find, right? The area of the rectangle should be whatever this height is multiplied by whatever that width is. 
That's what trapezoidal da rule does. It simply takes the average of these two points, multiplies it by uh, the width, and that is the area. And it keeps repeating that. Computers are great in repeating a simple rule. Once you understand the simple rule, you can ask it to be repeated. So it does that and then adds them all up. And that's what trapezoidal rule does. And that's what the function TRAPZ does. You give it a set of vectors and you can also give, for example, if the data are not equally spaced, the first one is like this, the second data point is like this, the third data point is like that. These are called unequally spaced data points. Then you need to tell what are the x locations also so that it can calculate this width. But if the width is all uniformly spaced, then all you have to give is give the height and it will calculate the integral under that uh, curve. Okay, So geometrically, that's what trapezoidal rule does. Any questions on that? Okay. So let's execute that. Okay. So to this trapezoidal rule, I guess I have an error somewhere. Here is a good opportunity for you to find out the error. What error would that be? It didn't execute. I was trying to execute line 20. Let me repeat that one more time. Okay. I've executed up to line 19. I said 19 is fine. And I say execute 20, it went back and it prints me an error message. Take a look at it and see whether you can fix it. This is the exact, very good. Okay. This is part of the things that I would expect you in a quiz or an exam. Okay, I put deliberately some bugs and ask you to find out where those bugs are. Okay. So I changed spontaneously here xi. But originally I had x here, so I should change that to xi. Okay. Now if I go to MATLAB, I have the efficiency as 0.6034. What is the efficiency? Efficiency is simply integral from 0 to 1 of theta d psi. And that's exactly what this line does. Okay, So xi is the independent location. Theta is the temperature, the first array of theta, first row of theta as the temperature. Okay, So I take that, calculate the integral, and that gives me the efficiency. Now the next one, can you look at this and relate it to what we have done? It's minus theta 2 comma 1 divided by m. <coughs> what is that? <coughs> one is minus d theta d psi divided by m. d theta d psi is in the second row. That's why I put 2 here. So I'm saying find the derivative at the, and what does the 1 say? Is at the very first entry, that is at the base of the fan, at psi equal to 0. Remember, I need to calculate the derivative at psi equal to 0. So this 2 says that is the derivative. Second row contains derivatives. First row contains just theta. Okay. So I take the derivative, but not all the derivatives, only the first derivative at the psi equal to 0. And then divide it by m, and that should give me the efficiency. Okay. And if I go back, and that is executed, and you'll find it is 0 0.6034. They give you exactly the same result. Okay. And now you can ask the question, okay, how does the efficiency of the fin change as I change m? M is an important parameter. That means I can change H, I can change L, I can generate a design curve, efficiency versus M. And then a process operator all has to do is look at what M is and you can know what the efficiency is. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. On the first integral, you have beta D psi. Yeah. Right? Where is the D psi in the MATLAB? That's that's a good question. Where is the D psi in the MATLAB? D psi is if you go back to, let me see. Why is this changing me there? So your question is, this is what I'm trying to evaluate using TRAPZ. To that I'm passing only x and theta. So where is d psi? Okay. D psi is the distance in the x-axis. So in the trapezoidal rule, what that means is it is this distance, this distance, this distance, distance between two neighboring points. So if I pass to <coughs> trapezoid all the x values, can it calculate that d psi internally? It can, right? How can it do that? Just take the difference between x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2. So trapezoidal rule does it internally using that x vector. So I'm passing two 
two variables if you look at it carefully, and the second variable contains the x location. So it takes the differences to multiply what is the horizontal length, and then takes the average on the vertical length, and then just takes a product. Okay. <coughs> good, good question, good observation. So you can actually, that kind of thinking says you can actually try to map whatever you have on the piece of paper, MATLAB has to be able to do. How does it do that? Okay. Sometimes it's not transparent, but in this particular case, it's not transparent, but it does it internally using the independent variable and the dependent variable. Okay. <coughs> Any other question? Okay. <coughs> so what I'm going to do for the first midterm, this would be the cutoff point. Okay. I'm going to start a new topic from uh, this point on. So for your first midterm exam, you will be examined on development of model, classification of models, and setting up the models like you have done in your assignment 3, building the matrices or uh, the one that we did where you convert a higher order system into an equivalent first order system. Things like that will be uh, in the first midterm exam. Okay. Now, uh, ki kind of a review in MATLAB, what have we done so far and what you should be familiar with. There will be a component of MATLAB related questions in the midterm exam, but those will be like the ones that you had in the quiz one. What does this MATLAB construct do? What does this command do? Or here is a small code that solves a particular problem. Uh, what does it do? Okay, I, mean, I will ask you to interpret it or fix errors in that. Okay. But you should be very comfortable by now with array structures. What do we mean by array and how do we address various parts of arrays? How do we compose? How do we make, build an array uh, tools for that? You should, uh, array addressing, okay? indexes and stuff like that. <coughs> in terms of programming, for loops, if loops, while loops, you should be very comfortable in at least interpreting the code. So somebody gives you a piece of code, you should be able to say, oh, this is what it does. I can understand that. You should reach that level. <laughs> and logical operators. Okay, equal to double equal to sign or greater than equal to less than or equal to what does it do and uh, how can you use that okay and then functions how arguments are passed what is uh, passed from one to the other <coughs> scope of the local and global variables things like that you should know and you should sl slowly build your expertise in the range of tools that are available in MATLAB okay so called built in functions okay there are a number of them and we are slowly expanding our knowledge base. In fact, there are 10,000 functions or something like that in MATLAB. Even I don't know all of them. I probably know 5% of what is in there. But the ones that we have seen, the backslash operator, the inverse operator function, these are all built-in functions. Determinant, eigenvalue, LU decomposition, polynomial, factoring, roots. F0 is the same as F solve. We haven't specifically seen F0. The only difference is they both solve nonlinear algebraic equations. F0 handles only one equation and one unknown, whereas F solve solves any number of equations in an equal number of uh, unknowns. And then we have seen ODE45, 15S, BVP4C. Today we saw trapezoid. And there is another function called quad, which does the same thing, uh, finding integrals of the functions. Uh, in the next assignment, I will give you one that deals with using ODE45 and BVP4C. <coughs> and more important, I think, is the ability to learn on your own is very important in MATLAB, okay? Because it's, there's so much there and we're not going to be able to cover everything. There is an excellent book. I have put a link to that. It's really downloadable. It's written by Cleve Moeller. Moeller is one of the founders of MATLAB 20, 30 years ago. He built this as a very small matrix laboratory for teaching in his own courses. And uh, so he has a very nice book that illustrates the various features of MATLAB. So that's end of chapter one. <clears throat> and chapter two to some extent, the linear algebra. Okay. So we are going to go to chapter three in the book, which deals with root finding. So we are going to talk about basic question we are going to answer in this chapter is how does F solve work? What kind of ideas are used in solving a system of nonlinear algebraic equations? So we are going to learn to develop our own algorithms that will do similar to what F solve does. Okay. <coughs> So what, what is root finding? Root finding is the problem as we saw, if you are given an equation f of x equal to 0, find me that value of x which makes that f equal to 0. 
That is the basic problem. Okay? And the easiest conceptual way of doing that would be if I can plot that function f of x as a function of x. In MATLAB, we can do that. We can write a function. If you tell me what the function is, I can write. And then I can pass a vector x to it and I get a vector of functions. I can plot those values. Okay, And if you want, connect them. So that is a graphical representation of that f of x. And f of x is a nonlinear function. If f of x is a linear function, what would you do? How would a linear function look? f of x equal to 0. A single equation and a single unknown. It should look like 10x equal to 2. What is x? Of course, that's a trivial problem, right? That's the linear single equation, algebraic equation in a single unknown. But how would a nonlinear equation look like? It could look like e to the power x times <coughs> sine x plus 5 equal to 0. Sine is a nonlinear function, e to the power x is a nonlinear function. Okay? <coughs> Let me make it e to the power minus x, for example. So when I sketch that kind of a function, how will it look like? There is an exponential decay and then there is a sine. So the function may actually look like this. So when I say find me a solution, find me values of x that makes this function equal to 0, if I can plot it, I can then look at where that occurs. One occurs here and maybe one occurs there. So maybe there are three roots, three values of x that satisfies that function f of x equal to 0. Okay? That is basically what we mean by uh, solving a linear, uh, nonlinear algebraic equation or root finding, finding the roots of a given differential equation. <laughs> the example that you did in your assignment number three, the last example, is an example of a single nonlinear equation that comes from a uh, separation process. Okay? So <coughs> that problem had a number of parameters. Okay, the liquid flow rate, the vapor flow rate, the equilibrium ratio, they're all numbers that are given. So in any problem, like the problem that we did in fin problem, the uh, heat transfer coefficient, the length of the fin, etc., are parameters. So these parameters are known numbers. The only unknown is x. But as you change the parameters, the solution can change. If I change the parameter, I may get a completely different curve, something like this. So the roots might change. So the roots are dependent on the parameters. That means the x is dependent on p. And our job is to find that x as the parameter changes, for example. Okay? Any question in the concept? The concept is root finding simply says, if you give me an algebraic equation, nonlinear algebraic equation, I need to find those values of x that makes that equation equal to 0. And I can do it graphically if I have only one equation in one unknown. If I have two equations in two unknowns, can you do it graphically? Can you imagine in your mind how will that look? Two equations and two unknowns, if you have to graph it. <coughs> it is tough, isn't it? To imagine, because now we have to imagine a, a three-dimensional graph. Okay? <coughs> <coughs> if you take one function, f1, let's just think about it a little bit. Okay, because we'll come back to this later. I have f1 as a function of x1 and x2 equal to 0. And I have f2 as a function of x1, x2 equal to 0. And I want to find x1 and x2 that makes f1 and f2 equal to 0. That's conceptually, it's the same problem. Whether it's one equation or two equation or ten equation, it's the same idea. And f sol uses all, handles all of them very easily. Okay, but we are trying to understand the concept. So what is the concept graphically? And of course, even here we are going to struggle. When you go to three, three equations, three unknowns, we just give up. But algorithmically, once we figure out the procedure, we can apply the procedure to any n-dimensional system. So for a two-dimensional system, if I have to plot f1 as a function of x1 and x2, how is it going to look? <coughs> so here I have x1, I have x2, and here I have f. On the vertical axis, I'm plotting f. It could be either f1 or f2. Okay. One nice way of thinking about it is think of a mountain. Okay? The elevation at any point x, y is going to change on the mountain, right? And that is your function f. <coughs> okay, so what you're having when you're plotting that function, just like in the one-dimensional case, the function was a curve like this. 
In a two-dimensional case, the function would be a surface, the surface of a mountain. Okay, And the function is not going to be equal to zero everywhere. So what do I want to find? I want to find that value of x where the function is equal to zero. Okay, So I get one mountain. Remember, imagine this to be a surface. So I can be at any location. I know what the x1 and x2 are, the longitude and the latitude. Think of this as your x and y coordinate or x1 and x2 coordinate. So at any given x1 and x2, I know what the height is. Okay, And I have this is my first function f1. I have a second function right? that represents a second mountain. Okay. These two mountains are going to intersect. Okay. And the intersection would be what? A point, a line, a curve, a line. So if you have two surfaces, two surfaces that are intersecting, that intersection is going to be a line. Typically in the mountains, if you have gone hiking, you would see that this would be the places where the river flows, right? When the two mountains have a, a valley kind of a thing, and that's where the river flows. Okay, so that's a curve. Now, what we want is we don't want points on the curve. What do we want? We want that curve to intersect the xy plane, right? And that is our solution. Our solution is we want to find where that curve goes and intersects the x1, x2 plane. So that's the place where the river reaches the ocean, if you like, right? So that's the place where you hit the sea level, okay? That function is zero, okay? So what are the coordinates of that? That's what we are trying to find, okay? We're trying to find two values of x1 and x2 that makes f1 and f2 equal to zero. So at least in the two-dimensional case, we can give a graphical pictorial representation. If you go for three-dimensional case, it's not going to be possible. But the ideas that we develop for one-dimensional case will naturally extend to any dimensions algorithmically, like a procedure, like a recipe, which we will use. So we're going to look at what kind of pr procedures are available. <coughs> any questions on that? OK, let's take this equation, f of x equals sine of x, which is equal to 0. And I ask you the solution. How many values of solutions are there? Hmm? Infinitely many. Because that curve, if you plot that curve, you're going to get Something like this just goes on on both sides, right? So every one of this is going to be a solution where the function is equal to zero. So it has infinitely many solutions at, in fact, we know exactly where they are, at r equal to n pi. So r is what we call the root. Root is that value of x where the function is equal to zero. So there are only some sets. Uh, most often you have finite number of sets, but there are equations like this where you have infinitely many values that will satisfy that equation. Okay, So here are a few other examples. x cubed minus 4x squared plus 4x squared plus x minus 6 equal to 0. What is the degree of the polynomial? 3. So how many roots are there? 3. For polynomials, polyno for polynomial type of nonlinearity, we know beforehand how many solutions there are maximum possible solutions. Okay, If it's a cubic polynomial, we'll have three roots and you know how to factor it. In MATLAB, <coughs> what is the function that gives you these three roots? You have used it in your first assignment. You cannot afford to forget it within this course. You can afford to forget it next year. That's called roots. And roots takes as an input the coefficients of these polynomials. For example, 1, 4, 1 again, and minus 6. So C in this case would be a vector, which is 1, 4, 1, minus 6. So if you give four numbers, it knows it's a cubic polynomial. It will automatically find all the three roots of the polynomial. Okay? Similarly, <coughs> here the, all the three roots are different from each other. They are distinct. Okay? So that means if I plot that function f of x, I probably will get a curve like this. So there are exactly three values. Okay, This is for the first equation. <coughs> now, if I take the second equation, what do you notice about special about that? Two roots are identical. That is, they are repeating. Now, what does it mean to say that the root is repeating? <coughs> you can Right, you can factor that equation as x plus 2 squared times x minus 1 equal to 0. 
this equation is the same as that. That means the, that root occurs with uh, a frequency of 2. So it's called multiple roots. Graphically, how would it look like? <clears throat> These two roots, for example, could be approaching each other as I change one of the coefficients. Coefficients are your parameters now. Okay? So the graph may look something like this. It just touches that. Okay, that means that there are two roots. Can you have three roots being the same with multiplicity of three? How will the graph look like? These are all things you might have seen in algebra way back in uh, even um, high school. You would have an inflection point. This is a cubic one. So if you have, for example, something like this. Okay, then you have all three roots at that particular point. So that would mean that function could be written as x minus r cube equal to zero. So it is possible to have multiplicity of roots and <coughs> if it occurs with multiplicity then you can say something more. You can say for example at this root the derivative is not zero. So these are distinct roots. If you have a distinct root at that point the derivative is not zero. But if you have a multiplicity of 2, not only the function is 0, but its derivative is also 0. And if you have an inflection point with a multiplicity of 3, not only is the function 0, its first derivative is 0, and its second derivative is 0. These ideas you will see in thermodynamics course, for example, there is something called cubic equation of state, Peng Robinson equation of state, really called equation of state, etc. These are all coming from Van der Waals type of equations to predict the phase behavior of gas liquid systems, natural gas systems, for example. So these behavior are very important to understand that you could have multiplicity of one, two, or three, and at the critical point, in fact, you will have something like this. Okay. <clears throat> so th that, that is important to understand that there is a possibility of multiplicity of roots. We should be able to handle, when we construct our algorithms, we should be able to handle these cases. Okay. <clears throat> And here you have only one root. What happens to the other roots? If you pass these coefficients to MATLAB, which I would encourage you to do tonight, you will see what, what it prints out as the three roots. Okay? And then you tell me, because I'm not going to tell the answer for that. I want you to kind of discover it on your own. So there are situations where there is only one real root. Okay? And all these things are possible. Any questions? So these are some of the functions for the sine and for the 3. Uh, here is the double root and here is uh, just one real root. Okay? The tangent here is not z 0. So there is only one real root but the question is what happens to the other roots. So now we understand a little bit about the nature of nonlinear equations. Okay? The nonlinear equations can, can have any number of roots. If it's a polynomial type of nonlinearity, we know exactly how many roots we have. If it is anything other than that, transcendental functions, sines, cosines, exponential, etc., we may not even know beforehand how many such solutions are possible. Okay? <coughs> so we need to develop a strategy for finding these solutions. And that is what algorithm development is. Okay? Maybe that's a good place to stop for today. And we'll pick it up uh, after, uh, after your midterm exam. So, we can just stop that.